All right, this is your test review for chapter 20 and 21 dealing with imperialism, World War I, and the Roaring Twenties. Remember, this uh, review only covers a certain amount of the test. That Make sure that you go back and you read through the book and you go through your notes in pre preparation for the test. So we're going to start thinking, of, we're going to start talking about uh, imperialism in the United States. Um, just some things to think about, possible topics that you might need to write about in the future is, well, we've already written about comparing the viewpoints between imperialist and anti-imperialist leading into, uh, not into World War One, but also after World War I, uh, how uh, American imperialism of the late 19th and 20th centuries maintained continuity and foster change between the American foreign policy, going all the way back to Washington's farewell address, and then how imperialism was a turning point in American foreign policy which is something that we'll continue to study as we get into World War II and after World War II. So going all the way back to Washington's farewell address, we know that he created a uh, <clears throat> kind of an isolationist point of view by saying not getting involved in foreign alliances, which we know that that's going to get broken in um, 19 and uh, after uh, during World War I. And remember, this is something that uh, somebody like a Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, a Republican uh, who voted against the League of Nations, would have been uh, solely for. Um, the first form of foreign policy, you remember, was the Monroe Doctrine, not allowing any European colonization uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And then later on, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's going to add the Roosevelt Corollary, which is going to basically give us the power to act as big brother uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. We had also uh, expeditions that were heading out to uh, the Far East and to Japan and China. So you can see that the United States was uh, beginning to assert, assert itself um, um, from an imperialistic standpoint. Uh, we purchased Alaska in 1867. Um, that was done by William Seward, which was uh, deemed a uh, deemed a big joke, but we know today what uh, what natural resources Alaska has to offer. Uh, we take Hawaii, we overthrow uh, Queen uh, Lalukalawi, and uh, and the American businessmen are going to are going to take Hawaii uh, because of sugarcane and where it was an ideal place to uh, build Pearl Harbor. Um, and so you can see the split the difference between the uh, the two territories. Um, you know, going all the way back to Manifest Destiny, uh, if you remember, you know, the, we believe that it was a God-given right uh, to take the land. Remember, this is a very um, where uh, white America, very culturally uh, superiority, and we use that as our justification. It's no different. If you remember the five Ds of imperialism, one of them is deity. And deity is taking that uh, white man's burden that was developed by uh, Great Britain and Rudyard Kipling in the, in the poem, uh, White Man's Burden. Well, we've got to bring them our our style of civilization, our God, and uh, our machines. And that's uh, spreading kind of that white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant um, ideology uh, to the other parts of the world. Uh, we believe that we believe in in spreading self government, but you remember it's in the name of democracy, and uh, by doing that, manifest destiny as well is uh, by um, you know using the ideology of the uh, Declaration of Independence, where we believe in uh, self government. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we broke away from uh, Great Britain. Um, the spread of uh, you know, controversy. Uh, is going to sue is manifest destiny. I really need a manifest destiny map on this, but um, you're going to see some stuff on manifest destiny. Um, remember that when the issue of slavery um, <clears throat> uh, kind of reared its ugly head uh, throughout manifest destiny, it led to uh, civil war. But now we're going to take it over. We're going to take it overseas, and we're going to spread our influence in places like Hawaii, in Cuba, in the Philippines, in Puerto Rico, and it starts with the uh, Spanish America War. Uh, we wanted to gain. One of the other reasons for, um, you know, one of the five Ds was gaining raw materials um, for uh, for resources for to make dollars, and that's to gain overseas markets for uh, materials. So a place like uh, China and the open door policy would be in Latin America would be reasons why we wanted to expand our influence uh, outside the United States, outside Manifest Destiny, is taking Manifest Destiny uh, worldwide. So if you remember the Spanish America War, we're going to um, side ourselves with the <coughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. And we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, take the position with the Cubans against the Spanish uh, during uh, on the onset of the Spanish-American War. Uh, remember when the USS Maine blew up, um, 
the newspaper started spreading the spreading the rumor that is Spain that that blew up the ship, which we know wasn't true, and that was a form of yellow journalism. We know that the Delome letter, uh, where the Spanish ambassador basically called McKinley very weak. Uh, these are all reasons why we we're going to go to war with Spain. Um, but those are the two main reasons: the USS Maine and, the, and yellow journalism, and the Delome letter. And you should have wrote about that uh, last week when, when you did your little quiz. Um, the Spanish American War was was nicknamed the Splendid Little War. It was really really quick. Um, we're going to uh, take Cuba, we're going to take the Philippines, and in the Treaty of Paris of 1898, we're going to, uh, we're going to gain Puerto Rico, we're going to gain Guam, uh, we're going to gain the Philippines, and we're going to be a military protectorate over, uh, over uh, Cuba. And we debated, you know, kind of why we, uh, why we should sign it, why we shouldn't sign it, and we did that uh, in class in our model Congress. So there are acquisitions. Um, you know, we there's all these little islands are all considered United States territory. A lot of these we didn't talk about in class, but you know, we've talked about Hawaii, we've talked about Guam and the Philippines. Now we have a presence in the Far East, uh, keeping kind of tabs on what's going on in China and Japan and also Southeast Asia, especially when uh, the Vietnam War comes up. We'll gain Puerto Rico. We'll also gain uh, rights to be a military protectorate over uh, Cuba. Um, and then here's the information, the Teller Amendment, uh, prevented the U.S. annexation of Cuba. And then the Platt Amendment, which gives us the right to intervene uh, to preserve Cuban independence. We can take that a little bit extreme. Uh, make sure you know the arguments for and against imperialism. Um, you know, here here are the proponents and the uh, opponents, which we did in, in the Model Congress. So a lot of these uh, arguments were already made, and you've already done research on it. So I think we're in good shape there. Uh, this political cartoon will be on your test. So make sure you can see that the bald eagle, which is our national bird, you can see that it spreads our influence uh, uh, across Across the world, you notice all the way from Puerto Rico to uh, to Manila. Um, let's see what else? Um, more political cartoons dealing with uh, the white man's burden. Uh, taking the Philippines. Remember, the Philippines did not. Uh, uh, Filipinos did not accept Americans coming into their territory, and they caused an insur insurrection led by Emilio Aguinaldo. Um, and you can see that. Um, it was it raises a controversy of uh, whether or not we should intervene in other people's and other people's affairs. Are we violating the the ideas of the Declaration of Independence by uh, doing so and not allowing uh, self government? Um, here's the uh, the uh, white man's burden by Rudyard Kipling. Y'all saw that in the collaborative room. Uh, the argument for and against the Philippines. Remember, you can always stop and, and read up on these and make sure you understand the arguments of, uh, of these things. Um, the open door policy in China is going to give the United States access to China. But remember, it was the boxers that uh, rebelled against the uh, rebelled against uh, missionaries and uh, American businessmen and uh, tried to drive them out before it was put put down by uh, Europe, the uh, us, the European of the Japanese to uh, squash the rebellion. Um, this uh, this uh, Roosevelt's big stick policy, where our ideology or our philosophy was uh, speak softly but carry a big stick. Um, this uh, political cartoon is going to be on your on your test. We've talked about the other one, but remember he holds his big stick. This is and he's kind of leading around kind of all the problems of of Latin America. And we're just going to kind of act in, as big brother. He signs the Roosevelt Corollary, which is is an extension of. Um, an extension of the Monroe Doctrine, except now we're going to in intervene in the financially unstable nations in Central and South America that are indebted to European creditors, all because we want to have uh, access to the resources in uh, Latin America. We're even going to build the Panama Canal, which connects the Atlantic Ocean to the uh, Pacific, uh, Pacific Ocean, and uh, we're going to even encourage a revolution by the Panamanians and then construct the uh, canal. Um, and then here's more on his, the big stick policy. Uh, he'll build up our Navy and the Great White Fleet, which is basically a world, worldwide tour to demonstrate our goodwill, but also display our, our power. Uh, William Taft and his dollar diplomacy uh, encouraged Americans to invest in, in foreign nations. Um, the Banana Wars, which uh, Central and South American nations ex were exploited by American corporations and uh, and uh, yeah, those are going to take those. Lodge Corollary. Uh, expand the Monroe Doctrine to any foreign interest to acquire territory in the Western Hemisphere. That will be on your test. Moral diplomacy, uh, promoting uh, democracy and peace worldwide. That mainly uh, pertains to Mexico. You can kind of see the political cartoon with Mexico, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. 
Um, American interventions under uh, Wilson won't need to know that for the test, but you can always just take a look at the uh, PowerPoint. And guys, just because I'm not going over it today doesn't mean you won't need to know it somewhere down the line. Uh, Mexican Revolution, we talked about the this and the elements of imperialism uh, activity, where uh, you know y'all gave presentations on these different countries. And like I said, you should know the stories of of those eight countries that we went over in class. Uh, so I'm not going to get into depth in that. All right. So that should be all on Manifest Destiny. Just checking my notes to uh, make sure, you know, it's going to always open up the question about intervention and uh, intervention and isolation. And that's going to be something that's going to be a, a continuity going into World War II and after World War II. And even getting into the war on, on terrorism is how much, uh, how much influence should Americans have in other territories. All right. So regarding um, World War I. We're not really necessarily worried about what happened overseas. There are a lot of things that we went over in class that you need to know for your start test. So just keep that in mind. But for the uh, for the things about the test is going to be mainly driven about what's what's going on in the United States during at the time. You know, we talked about you know the the main causes. This is kind of a world history slide of what causes. So you should be rather familiar with that if you took world history last year. Uh, we're going to deem ourselves isolationist until um, unrestricted submarine warfare occur with the Lusitania. And then uh, the final final straw was the Zimmerman note that got was an offer to Mexico to um, inter if they intervened against the United States that they would get their territory back. And uh, there's you know there's examples of submarine warfare. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Russia Revolution is going to happen in 1917. This is where the Soviet, uh, United, uh, Russia will turn into the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, let's see, getting to the Zimmerman Telegraph and the uh, Declaration of War. Uh, Congress will declare war on April 5th, 1917. And uh, we talked, to, um, if you were George Norris or Woodrow Wilson, you had an opinion about whether or not to join World War One or not. All right, so let's talk about the, let's talk about World War One at home, all right? So one of the things that happens is that we're, we need to raise money for the war. And so these were done in the forms of Liberty Bonds. The Liberty Bonds were basically, basically the United, the people of the United States were giving loans to the United States government, and then they were issued a bond. And a lot, of, what a lot of people did is they held onto those bonds, and they would mature over time with interest, and then they were able to cash them back in and kind of make a profit. It's almost like investing in the United States. Uh, uh, government and army, if you will, during during times of war. Uh, several war agencies were, were commissioned to kind of coordinate uh, the purchase and allocation of war materials, make sure that labor labor unions weren't, weren't going to prevent, uh, weren't going to do any strikes during that time because America made a lot of money uh, manufacturing weapons. Uh, we also needed to uh, ration food and encourage the American people to do that. And a lot of this was done by the pub, pub, uh, Committee of Public Information. And this was led by a guy by the name of George Creel. And remember that his goal was to basically um, to promote patriotism and to promote uh, support for the war. And anybody that undermined the war was subject to um, uh, subject to um, a fine or a misdemeanor charge or even the, the thought of going to jail. And so the basically the, the goal of the, of the uh, Committee of Public Education is to spread American uh, propaganda. Now, if you remember in class, I told you that this was going to be on your test, right? And it's, you know, a listing, uh, you know, to stop the Germans from, from taking from taking over the world. And this is, you know, this is very similar to kind of what the muckrakers did. These are journalists that, uh, muckrakers are journalists that expose the evils of society. We're propaganda. Uh, you know, these are people that are trying to um, to sway the American emotion uh, for the war, just like muckrakers are trying to sway the American people to uh, ask, ask the government to to, um, to intervene, well, this is no different. You're playing on emotions here. So you would go maybe to a movie house and, and see videos of the glory of war, and that would want Americans to uh, join the war, not knowing the the uh, atrocities of war. Um, you know, civil liberties were curbed during World War II through the, uh, through the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Um, so we talked about Shank versus the United States, Abrams versus the United States. We talked about that with the Nearpod lesson. Uh, immigrants in the immigrants in the United States uh, were expected to be loyal, but uh, Germans that lived in the United States during this time were highly discriminated against and sought out by the government because they thought that they might be undermining the uh, the war in 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 Europe. Um, Whereas, uh, oh, John J. Pershing was the leader of the American Expeditionary Force, uh, which is the U.S. Army. Uh, we're going to recruit and uh, we're going to pass the Selective Service Act in 1917, which requires all men from 18 to 45 to register. And two million men were drafted and two million uh, men volunteered. Um, and uh, let's see what else. 
uh, just some major war events. You don't need to know any of this for the test. Uh, this is more for uh, world history. You do need to know a lot about uh, Wilson's 14 points. And this was kind of his uh, his 14, 14 things that should define uh, a post, what a post-world war, a post war world should look like and so some examples here so like example for number two it says freedom of the seas and peace and war so this goes back to lusitania being sunk and un unrestricted uh submarine warfare uh the reduction reduction of armaments because one of the reasons for world war one was um World War One was uh, militarism. Uh, the let's see what else do you need to know? Uh, the big one is the League of Nations and how the United States. Uh, he urged a League of Nations to be formed. The problem was that the United States uh, Congress, led by the Republican Party and uh, and uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, are going to reject uh, this League of Nations. And we're going to put the blame solely on Germany um, uh, for that. So I think those are kind of the big things that uh, the fourteen points are part of, which are going to be part of the treaty of Versailles. And so here you see the picture of kind of the big four. Remember that Woodrow Wilson was the hero of World War One. The United States comes out looking good after World War One becomes the most popular, not most popular, but the most powerful country in the world. And they're going to put Germany as the sole responsibility of the war. Uh, we're going to strip Germany of all their um, of all their economic output and kind of leaves them in despair. This is where this one allows Adolf Hitler to kind of take an opportunity to do that. Uh, remember the treaty was, was uh, rejected mainly because of a group that led by Henry Cabot Lodge and the reservationists and the air, uh, air conciliables, which uh, these guys were, uh, they outright rejected the treaty uh, altogether and it failed in the Senate. And so there was United States didn't join the League of Nations. League of Nations lasted for a short while and then dies. But you see itself resurrect itself uh, through the United Nations. Um, only 116,000 were killed, which compared to other nations was not a whole lot. Uh, some nations lost, you know, anywhere from 20 to 25 million. Some reports could even say 40 million. Um, a lot of them will die because of the Spanish flu outbreak that happened in 19, uh, in 1918. Um, and so you see a whole generation of men that were killed, uh, during this time. Um, let's see here. All right. Yeah. Here's more of the, uh, the, uh, Spanish flu. Um, you know, after after World War One, we're going to hit a little recession, mainly because of Europe is uh, going to um, Europe was at late in ruins after World War One. Remember, this whole war was fought in Europe, and so uh, cities are are destroyed, towns are created. Uh, are destroyed and so there has to be a time of rebuilding so the economy is going to decline by 21.5 percent but you're not going to see that in the united states for another 10 years uh because of the change to communism uh there is our first red scare which is the fear of the united or of the communists coming in now during the first red scare we're worried about communism in labor unions in the second red scare we're going to worry about uh, communism uh, affecting our government so make sure that we can uh, decipher between the two so you can see you know, labor unions from the strikes to riots to Bolshevism to chaos. So uh, you can see the steps of the, of the uh, first Red Scare. And so things like um, strikes that hurt, occurred in 1919, um, they, they kind of thought of this as, as an anarchist and uh, as were associated with, uh, with communism or, or socialism, led to, uh, you know, racism where many African Americans are going to move to the north. This is the ma great migration looking for a better economic opportunity. Uh, a lot of race riots because they're all competing for jobs uh, in 1919. Uh, there's even one in uh, Tulsa. Palmer raids were uh, where A. Mitchell Palmer is going to uh, start begin going after potential communists in the United States, and he was the target of several uh, bombings that occurred uh, in the United States. You can see all the people that uh, communists target A. Mitchell Palmer, who was the, uh, I believe he becomes the leader of the uh, CIA. John D. Rockefeller, we've talked about. J.P. Morgan Jr., we've talked about. Um, and uh, and so this is going to lead to the emergence of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI and the uh, CIA. All right. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into the Roaring Twenties. So the Roaring Twenties is going to be the topic that we talk about the least in class, but you did the reading guide, and we did the Socratic seminar on Monday, or if you're watching the Sunday night, uh, that we're going to do tomorrow. So uh, the Roaring Twenties encompasses a lot of different topics, um, and some of these are going to be on the test, and obviously some of them aren't, but uh, they can always end up on the uh, on the uh, AP test. So going politically, starting with the election of 1920, if you remember, Woodrow Wilson is going to suffer a stroke trying to uh, 
uh, go out to the American people and plug his uh, uh, League of Nations. And so uh, he cannot run for a third term. So Warren G. Harding is going to emerge as the Republican candidate. He uh, has the phrase, a return to normalcy, returning to what life was like before uh, World War I, and he's going to win uh, the presidency in uh, 1920. Now, Warren Harding was uh, known as one of our worst presidents in the United States, mainly because of the scandals that occurred, mainly the Teapot Dome scandal, where one of his, uh, I can't remember who it was, but one of his uh, cabinet members is going to lease uh, government owned uh, oil land in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, uh, to somebody and basically pocket the uh, money. Uh, Harding will die while he's in office, but while he was president, he's going to pass the Emergency Quota Act in 1921, the Ford D. McCumber Tariff in 1922. Calvin Coolidge, who is the vice president, will take over as president and then run uh, for, again in 1924 and will win, mainly because uh, he was conservative. Uh, the, the economy at the time was booming. He was known as a silent cow. He didn't say a whole lot as, as president, uh, probably the kind of president that we'd like today, right? Um, but uh, he believed that the business of American people is business. And uh, so a, a rather popular president, especially because the economy in the United States was soaring in during the uh, 1920s. In 1928, uh, Herbert Hoover will run for president and he'll win and he actually will take the blame for the uh, Great Depression, even though the offsets, onsets of the Great Depression happened long before he became president. But anytime that our economy drops, we're going to look to see who the current president is and they'll get blamed for, for any depression. He believed in, in volunteerism. He believed in uh, that the people should pull themselves out, which sank the United States further into uh, the Depression. And then he'll lose to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. And uh, Roosevelt will put together the New Deal program, and uh, that will somewhat offset the, the Great Depression. But it won't be until World War II and into the 1950s that we'll actually pull ourselves out of the Great Depression. But um, he had no answers to how to deal with the stock market crash, and so he was he took a brunt of the blame for uh, the Great Depression. So um, here's more stuff that you can read about about politics during the 1920s. As far as uh, the American consumer. Uh, consumer society goes, we're going to start buying a whole lot more for what we want rather than what we need. Uh, it's called con uh, cons conspicuous consumption. And so things like uh, installment plans are going to become uh, more uh, more popular. And so you're going to see the uh, debt increase of Americans because people are buying stuff on ins installment installment plans. They're going to begin to buy things for recreational uh recreational reasons and the big one is going to be the model t all right the model t car and, and dealing with the module you know the model t uh, you know business investment that goes into um, um, uh, assembly line manufacturing is going to go up so more uh, american vehicles are going to increase as a result we're going to make more money so our gross national product is going to go up our gross domestic product is going to go up and then just the impact of our of our industry and our uh, technology, our advancement is going to is going to increase uh, the increase of cars in, in manufacturing. So you're going to start to see more cars because they're more affordable, because more people are uh, more more of them are being built because of supply and demand. So the prices are going to drop, and so people are going to be able to buy uh, these Model T cars. Uh, you see advertisements that are uh, begin become more popular in uh, magazines and along billboards because now that you have uh, now that you have a Model T car, you have uh, you know you have more roads and highways. You have uh, opportunities to go to things like hotels. Uh, you can um, you know the rubber and tires. You know, just little things like that that we don't realize that uh, these industries are going to go up. And advertising is going to be one of those industries that's going to swell uh, as a result of, of the cars. Uh, however, uh, immigration is going to begin to uh, uh, limit through the uh, quota laws of the Emergency Quota Act, the National Origins Act, um, because of the fear of uh, like communism coming into the United States. Uh, but they wanted to place uh, restrictions on immigration by by uh, origin, by um, ethnicity, and by race. And this is an extension of, of tension after World War One. So if you were a German that wanted to immigrate to the United States, they would probably only take about 3% of current Germans living in the United States. So not everybody was able to come into the United States like they were, like, say, in the days of Ellis Island or uh, Angel Island. And remember, during this time, they're still restricting uh, Asians from 
coming into the United States through the Gentlemen's Agreement and through the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. But you can see this political cartoon kind of says it all as far as the as far as the Immigration uh, Quota Act. This one's from 1921, I believe, um, that is limiting uh, immigration. Uh, for women, women are going to uh, uh, get the right to vote uh, as a result of the 19th Amendment. They're going to begin to feel uh, more free. And so here you see a picture of like a flapper who were the young women of the jazz age. They would cut their hair real short. They would go dancing, uh, smoke, be promiscuous. And so uh, most of these, uh, obviously this is going to happen more in the city. So you see an influx of girls that live in, live in the country or in a rural society coming to the city become flappers, and then they return home to their traditional, uh, real, you know, Protestant, slow country life, and they're going to be rejected uh, in those in those societies. And so you're starting to see kind of a clash of your fundamentalist Christianity versus the modern uh, modernist, right? And uh, you see that in prohibition. So when they limit prohibition, uh, this is going to lead to uh, more organized crime. You see more bootleggers that are, now, first of all, we know that prohibition is the elimination of the buying, selling, manufacturing producing of uh, alcohol uh, bootleggers are going to uh, are going to create alcohol uh, you know obviously kind of underground or on the side which is going to uh, give a rise to organized crime such as uh, uh, Al Capone and the federal government really can't do anything to, or really has a hard time trying to enforce law as of that and so you see this as another loss for your traditionalist or your modernist so you see you know these clashes of uh, society uh, the Ku Klux Klan is not only going to target the new Ku Klux Klan isn't just going to target African Americans now, but basically any um, any immigrants, any uh, gypsies, homosexuals. Basically, if you're not a white Southern Baptist Protestant, uh, you're you're going to be a target of the of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Um, also coming with the clash, and this is one of your themes, is kind of the clash of modernism with fundamentalism. And this took place when a teacher in Tennessee, John T. Scopes, uh, is going to... Um, is going to uh, get uh, arrested for teaching uh, uh, teaching evolution in the classroom, and so this led to the debate over creationism and evolution, uh, where uh, two two people, these guys down here, Clint William Jennings Bryan, which you should know who he is by now, he's going to actually argue as an attorney for creationism, uh, you know, for. Uh, teachings of the Bible versus a, a high power attorney at the time, Clarence Darrow, who's going to uh, basically trick, trick William Jennings Bryan on the stand that evolution was possible. Uh, bottom line is that uh, John T. Scopes gets, uh, he gets fined a hundred dollars for teaching evolution in the public classroom, which you probably wouldn't see uh, that much uh, today. Uh, also, 1920s was a time for uh, cult heroes such as Babe Ruth and, and Charles Lindbergh, which you should be doing research on that through your uh, Socratic seminar. Uh, the Jazz Age, and you know how controversial blackface is today uh, in the news. And, and uh, it was uh, this is uh, the jazz singer by Al Tolson, and he actually plays an African American, but he he's a white person. So, um, but uh, um, you know, song and dance through Louis Armstrong. Remember, this is also called the Jazz Age. Um, people are going to dance in speakeasies, uh, which are like under like secret clubs uh, where people drink alcohol, smoke, and, and you know they dance and and, par uh, and, and party basically. Um, the radio becomes the mainstream medium. Uh, it's a big invention that a lot of people are going to begin buying. And another example of technology and industrialization as part of the United as part of the United States. And then now movies are going to start becoming uh, more popular. Uh, the jazz singer, which you see the picture of, is the first uh, talking motion picture created uh, in 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 America. Uh, for the literature, uh, you should be doing research on the lost generation and their disillusionment with the world after World War One. Uh, all right, so Marcus Garvey, this guy here, believed in um, he believed in um, basically the Back to Africa movement, where he encourages. Hold on, I got my notes right here. Uh, he encouraged black separatism. Uh, he believed in, uh, like I said, the Go Back to Africa. This is a going against with the NAACP, W.D. DuBose, what he uh, was for. Remember, W.D. DuBose was for Civil Rights Now. Um, and then this guy, Marcus Garvey, who was a, who was a, a Jamaican immigrant, is going to uh, kind of come up with this idea for the going back to Africa. However, he could not put together the funding for it, so it never happened. It was a failed attempt migration to go to Africa, and to. And, but he does inspire black pride nationalism, and you can say that black separatism, you can go and you can, uh, you can compare it with the, uh, with the Black Panthers. 
And so um, this is also going to, during the time is the Harlem Renaissance. This is a uh, suburb of New York City uh, in Harlem that basically fueled this, uh, this movement of black nationalism, but also uh, music, jazz, uh, uh, writing through Langston Hughes, uh, jazz clubs, um, and like literature, and like I've already said that. Uh, so make sure you know that Langston Hughes was part of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he was part of the Great Migration, which, like I said before, was the uh, moving in of, of African Americans from the South to the North, looking for opportunities. But in New York City, they're all going to settle uh, along the Harlem Renaissance, and, and Harlem was the was the hotbed for uh, jazz and for uh, Black culture uh, to come alive by your Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and Langston Hughes, Messy Smith. Josephine Baker are also a uh, part of that. All right. And so that looks like that's the end of uh, the review. I think I covered everything. Um, you know, uh, make sure you do a good job studying for your tests. And if you have any questions, uh, come see me.